So for our 30th episode of vPython for Beginners, I wanted to show you how to implement a technique that I didn't learn until I was in graduate school, which is about how to tell how efficiently your code is running. Obviously, our number one goal when writing a physics code is accuracy. We want to get a, an answer that we have some level of confidence in. But we also want to make sure that we're using our computer time wisely, especially if we're having to pay for that computer time with a grant or with our own funds or, or department funds or whatever. Um, and so I want to show you how you can do that in vPython uh, with its built-in clock function. But this technique works with any programming language that has a built-in clock function. Uh, the way a clock function works is that uh, you you call a function called clock here. Let's call it let's call it the beginning here. Um, in in this case, it's it's called clock, and then just open parentheses, close parentheses. And what that does is it returns some measure of the system time. It could be your local time, the time at where the server's located. It could be the the time that's since the computer has been running. Um, regardless of, of how it's actually measuring the time, what you're interested in is the change in the time. So for example, suppose I've got a code like this one here that's relatively intensive. Um, this is my birthday paradox code uh, from an earlier video. Basically it assigns to a group of people uh, a random birthdays and then checks for whether any of them has a match. So there's several loops going on here. Uh, and there's also a larger loop here where we're conducting 100 trials to get an idea of what the probability is of any two people uh, having the same birthday given a sample size. Um, it's a really neat code. I like it. And it takes, what we'll see is we'll take, is it takes on the order of a few milliseconds to run. And the way you find that out is using this clock function. First you store the initial time. And the simplest way to do that is to call this ti for t initial. And then down at the end, you just bracket it with another call to clock tf for t final equals clock. So this call to clock is going to get the time when it reaches line 32. This call to clock is going to get the time when it starts here at line three. And so I can get the change in time, or I can get the, the, the time difference, just by saying print this program took, and then I just say t final minus t initial, I need a comma here, and that's going to be in units of seconds. So let's hit control two to run this and see what we get. We're going to get the usual code output for matches, etc. And this program took 0.0702 seconds. So it took seven hundredths of a second uh, and some change. Um, I, oh, I, that's why I didn't have a comma there. I don't need the comma inside the, the quotation marks there. And so basically what you've got is some system time up here, some system time on here, and then the difference, the difference being 0.027 seconds. So that's the very basic way to use this. There's another way you can use this though that makes it a little more efficient in terms of your memory. Um, what you can do is you can say, uh, let's see, instead of saying a T initial and a T final, what you can do is you can define something called total time and set that equal to zero. And then what you do is you say total time equals total time, uh, excuse me, other way around, you say clock minus total time. Now, I know that seems a little weird, but it's going to make sense in just a second. What we do with this now is take this line and copy it, and then we paste it down here, paste. And so what we've done is we've called the same line twice. So think about it this way. The first time I call total time, it's equal to the initial time minus whatever total time was before, in this case, zero. When I come down here to the end, it's going to be the current clock time minus that previous value. So it's going to be the current clock time minus the initial clock time minus a negative zero. Now that seems a little bit clunky at first, but it's going to be very rewarding to use the setup in just a minute. Um, and let me show you that that gives you the same results. Uh, so total underscore time instead here. So it should be about the same amount of time. Uh, this time it took 0 0.1087 seconds. So the loops might have taken longer. Uh, we might have gotten hung up on the server. But basically you're getting about the same order of magnitude on the order of a tenth of a second. There we go. Now, let's pretend that this is a little bit more intensive of a code. In fact, we can make this more intensive of a code, can't we? By having this thing uh, up the number of trials. So if I have a thousand trials instead, this should up this time to about one second because it should multiply the total runtime by about 10. Oh, it actually multiplied it by, uh, by about 30. Uh, let's run that again to see if that's a consistent feature. 
Yeah, so we're taking on the average about three and a half seconds now. So now you imagine you that, that you're doing this for, say, a dissertation or some major project, and you're having to do this uh, many, many times. Let's suppose this is taking you weeks for this code to run. Eventually, you want to start to look at where is the code taking up more time. So like, for example, this code is taking up three and a half seconds. Well, what is it spending three and a half seconds doing? Where is that three and a half seconds being allotted? And that's where using this little structure, this time value equals clock minus time value, comes in incredibly handy. What you do is you take a look at the code and examine where you think the, the time sinks are. So for example, the first thing I might look at would be this part where I've got the randomizing taking place. Maybe my random function is taking too long to run. So I wanna set up a, let's do this before we get to the total time here. I wanna set up a time spent randomizing, okay? And then I wanna look at the next piece. So the next piece is searching for matches here in this uh, double loop here. So I would look at time spent matching. And again, initialize that to zero. And then the last section I have is down here where I'm checking for matches. I'm not gonna worry about the single print statement down here because that's just, that, that, that's a one-time thing. I'm looking more at the things that get repeated because then I might look at those sections, see if I can, and can perform those sections more efficiently. So this is my time spent counting. So let's call it time underscore counting. And then what I do is I use this structure and I just bracket every section that has the type of activity that I'm looking at. So for example, for time spent randomizing, I look at where I'm doing the randomizing. Well, I start the randomizing right here where I declare the number of people. So I'm gonna bracket this with time randomizing. And what I do is use the same structure here, clock minus copy and paste clock minus, and then that same name here, time randomizing. So again, this is gonna take whatever the previous value was, subtract it off of the clock value, the, the, the value returned by the clock function, then I just copy and paste into this section right here at the end of this. So I'm bracketing this section, lines 21 through 24, with the time spent randomizing. And again, what this is going to do, it's, it's going to, the, doing this double subtraction, it's gonna preserve this value so that it gets added on over here, and it's going to subtract this clock value from this clock value. Now, the reason that's important is that I'm repeating this process a thousand times. So I'm not just doing one calculation like I'm doing up here with the total time, I'm doing 1,000 calculations of the time spent randomizing, because it's going through this randomizing loop a thousand times. Each time it's gonna preserve the current amount of time spent randomizing, and it's gonna to add to that the final time minus the initial time. And this is just a nice, efficient way to do this without having to have a T final and a T initial and subtracting them, and then adding the difference on to the, to the, to the total value. This is just a nice little way to do this in two lines. And then what I can do, of course, is repeat this process for the other section. So uh, let's see, our next section is searching for matches. So let's append that here. So this is the time spent matching, and I'm gonna copy and paste these variables. I've learned that saves me a little bit of headache with having to remember what I called things. And so we put that at the beginning of this section, then I go to the end of the matching section, oops, and I just paste this in here. I have one too many blank lines for my liking, there we go. So now I've got this whole section, lines 28 through 33, as the matching section. This is where I'm gonna measure how much time is spent matching. And then finally, I do the same thing here with the time spent counting. Let's copy and paste counting, control C to copy, control V to paste. Oops, I need an underscore there. And so here, I just copy, again, I copy this line because it's the same calculation every time and paste it into here. So now I'm gonna have my total time and then I'm gonna have the amount of time spent randomizing, the amount of time spent matching, and the amount of time spent counting. So we're gonna put in a few more print statements at the end here. And we're going to say time randomizing. And let's call this uh, randomizing, just so I can remember what my output was. Uh, let's do another copy and paste, paste. And so here, instead of randomizing, we'll have matching and we'll change this output to matching. And so what you do when you're when you're trying to debug your code or get an idea of, of evaluating its performance, 
Um, I guess it's performance evaluation, not debugging, excuse me. Um, this is what you do. You just have at the end, you tell it to print the amount, of, the amount of time that was spent in each type of section or each type of task, and you repeat these as necessary. So, for example, if I had more randomizing going on below, I would just uh, use the same thing. It's just going to keep adding to the total here. Let's hit Control-2 to run and see what we get. Okay, cool. So we have that this program took 3.5338 seconds. Okay, so, so three and a half, just call it three and a half. We see that one one hundredth of a second was spent randomizing. Uh, one one hundredth of a second is pretty small compared to three and a half. We see that 9.5 times 10 to the minus three seconds were spent on the matching part. And we see that 3.5 seconds, 3.49 of the 3.53 seconds were spent on the counting section. So let's go back over here. I want to add in one other thing because, uh, you know, obviously that tells me that the counting part is the majority, but maybe they're a little bit closer and I want to double check on them. You can also, of course, present this as a uh, percentage because you've already got the information. So you might as well take time randomizing, divide by total time. Uh, and we can, uh, let's see, let's multiply that by 100 and give it a percent sign just so we understand that we're talking about the percent here. So we got to copy, paste, paste. And instead of randomizing here, we'll have matching. And instead of count, randomizing here, we'll have counting. And that's just a nice other way to put it in case you lose track of the sense of scale that you're working with. And so here we definitely confirm, yes, we knew this was the majority of this number, but now we see it's 98%. So if I wanted to make this code more efficient, I know I need to look at my counting section because that's taking up 98% of the computer time. And I'm pretty sure I know how I could uh, do that. Uh, printing to the screen actually takes a significant amount of time. So I'm willing to bet that if I comment out these print statements, that this is going to reduce my time significantly. Let's hit Control-2 to run. I don't really need those print statements. Um, oh yeah, yeah, then I don't need this else if I don't have that. I don't really need those print statements because those are just more diagnostic. And lo and behold, I took those out and uh, the time went from three and a half seconds to 0.033 seconds. So we have had a an improvement of, of 100 uh, in terms of the efficiency. We, we have reduced the computer time by a factor of 100. We see that 12% of the time is spent randomizing, 25% of the time is spent matching, and 0.9% of the time is spent counting. Now you notice those don't, app to, those don't add up to 100%. So it's at this point that I would have to look at where my, uh, where I don't have time taken up. That's where I might look, for example, at how long it takes the, the program to define this function. Maybe that actually takes up a significant chunk of time. Um, or I might have to look at uh, actually, yeah, it's probably sunk in here because I do have a print statement here. Let's actually move this total time up here a couple lines before that print statement. Let's see if that fixes our problem. No, it doesn't. Okay, well, something for me to look at um, as I continue to explore using this clock function. But there you have it. There's a good way to examine how much of your computer time is being spent on each task is just using this clock function with this little uh, uh, time equals clock minus time structure. Very useful uh, technique, uh, very helpful when you're trying to improve your code's efficiency. So thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.